so much for inviting me to speak on this topic. When I see this topic of this magnitude of integrity, I am very excited. Can your social drinking put you at risk of developing AFib? Hi, I'm Dr. Ma. I'm from Malaysia. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me. Now, off the bat, let me tell my audience, if you want to know the answer, whether alcohol is associated with developing AFib or not, I give you this graph. It's very clear that there is a linear relationship between alcohol intake and development of AFib. If we want to know whether yes or no, I must tell you this, case closed, there is a relationship, mystery solved, then we all can go home, right? But of course, there are more to this. Let's take a step back and define what is social drinking. Now, obviously, it depends on the volume of alcohol consumption per session, right? Typically, we define over a course of week. What is light consumption? Light consumption is less than seven standard drinks per week. Moderate consumption, on the other hand, is seven to 21 standard drinks, SD, per week. And obviously, heavy consumption will be the one that above 21 standard drinks per week. It begs another question then, what is standard drinks? More and more terms need to be defined. What is a standard drink? A standard drink is defined as a drink contains 10 grams of pure alcohol. Now, 10 grams of pure alcohol means very little to lay people, actually, when we are drinking, right? Now, it means a small standard glass of wine. Just to put it into perspective, if we pop open a bottle of standard 75 centiliter wine, it contains eight standard drinks. And if you order a pint of stout beer or ale, it is two standard drinks. And a large can of beer is equivalent to two standard drinks or so. I hope we are on the same page with putting this perspective now. What are the pathophysiology the explanation be to, uh, behind why AFib can be promoted by alcohol intake. It basically has two pronged problem here. Number one, alcohol is a potent promoter of oxidative stress to the system. It increases the patient's blood pressure, it causes endothelial dysfunction, and increases this very bad RAAS activity here which subsequently will lead to development of left ventricular hypertrophy and coronary artery disease. Not only that, it also is a potent inflammation promoter whereby it causes this malude of all these bad actors all going on here, neutrophil infiltration, ACE expression, fibrosis, and matrix production, and so on and so forth. All these will cause increased damage and substrates formation in the atrial tissue level, hence causing atrial fibrillation to happen at the end. Let's look at some perspective data. Perspective data is the what data that we want to see because those are the data that have been gathered over a long period of time, prospectively, 12 years follow up, respectable, respectable. Number of patients here, 859,000 is a whooping big number here. How many cases of AF be detected here? 12,000. That is a very respectable number. What are the data inside this perspective data set here? The relative risk of developing AF is 1.08 for light drinking, 7 cent drink. So even light drinking, one cannot escape from the fate of increasing the risk of AF development. How about moderate from 7 to 21 is from 17 to 26% increase. Obviously, if you drink more, then the risk of AF development will be more. If you have 28 drinks, 36% increase. 35 drinks, 47%, nearly 50% increase. That's a lot. 
How about the data in the meta-analysis world, which equally we should uh, pay respect to? They found a similar dose response curve, my dear colleagues. For women, the threshold is slightly lower. The risk of AF increased by 70% for those consuming 14 standard drinks per week. Now, this is in a moderate consumption range, which we have defined earlier. For men, we have higher, a little bit higher threshold here. But if we drink more than 21 standard drinks per week, we are going to increase the risk by 25%. Let me switch gear and talk about this. Very, very important. Now, my, the topic that has been given to me is purely on social drinking and the risk of developing AF. But I hate to say that we cannot isolate ourselves by just talking about alcohol consumption. But really, the key is to look at the patient and look for all these key clinical factors. The presence of concomitant medical conditions substantially increases the risk of those patients developing AFib in the face of social drinking, hypertension, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, coronary artery disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, and heart failure. If your patient or the individual already has these established CV diseases, the advice I would give the patient is total abstinence from alcohol. You already score 99 marks in getting the bad results. Please don't score another one marks. You're going to get 100 marks from getting the bad results. I like this model by Dr. Voskop Boynik here, which is published fairly recently, about four years ago in Jack. His model speaks about the, I call it the cycle of violence here, whereby alcohol promotes hypertension, hypertension promotes more atrial substrate formation, alcohol also promotes OSA, and it promotes atrial substrate formation as well left ventricular hypertrophy does the same thing in the atrial level. They all turn around and they all do the same thing. They are potent atrial substrate modifier, which at the end and the final end, when we see the patient, they're going to manifest with atrial fibrillation or atrial tachyarrhythmias. I've shown this graph, nothing new, linear relationship between alcohol and AFib. Full stop, right? We nailed it. But I'd like to show you some more peculiar data here, which will, uh, for some of us, may be taken by a back. Are you ready? Lo and behold, in terms of risk of developing AF, yes, there is a linear relationship, but not with cardiovascular mortality. At least from the data we gathered until now, today, there is a J-shaped curve here. When you drink light to moderate, you decrease the risk of cardiovascular mortality, but still increase the risk of AF development. How can it be? It is very counterintuitive when I look at this. Now, there are many suggested so-called putative protective mechanisms of light to moderate consumption of alcohol here. I'll just list a few here. I think the main, main, main thing has been talked about in the, in the literature is going to be these two. Improvement in lipid profile, i.e. increase in the good cholesterol, the high density lipoprotein cholesterol, and increase in apple A1. And also light to moderate consumption has been associated with reduced platelet aggregation and endothelial, endothelial not the myocardial, endothelial inflammation. So it has decreased in all these bad actors, interleukin-5 and fibrinogen. But I must say a but here, a big but, B-U-T. But you cannot use this model of decreased cardiovascular mortality onto those patients whom they already diagnosed with AFib. No, no, because according to this paper, total abstinence is the way. You cannot have alcohol if you have already developed AF. Look at here, total abstinence versus control. Total abstinence has got way better AFib-free survival. 
and that is very strong data set here. So ladies and gentlemen, take homes very quickly. Point number one, we must admit that social drinking is associated with increased risk of AF. Nail in the coffin, it is, it is what it is, we must admit that. There is no safe volume or safe frequency of social drinking, which is free of association. We must recognize this fact. This is fact. But we also must know that light to moderate drinking is linked to the peculiar phenomena of decrease in cardiovascular mortality. But there's a but here, not in those whom they already had been diagnosed with cardiovascular diseases or AFib. My friends used to ask me sometimes over drink. <laughs> I would say, so doc, we should not drink, right? No drinking at all? No, no. I say, well, this is all about, now this is not about internal medicine anymore or cardiology anymore. This is psychology. It's about our perception of risk how we perceive risk. Like all of us, we drive a car every day to work or a motorcycle. We hardly walk to work, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure in your, in your part of the world, but at least in Malaysia, 99.99999% of people drive to work on a day, ride a motorbike. There are risks associated with uh, riding on a motor vehicle, but we do that anyway because our perception of risk here, acceptable or not? Is it voluntary or not? Is it control now? Can we control that now? Can, of course, we drive a car, we control the car, right? Hopefully so, yeah. Is it a clear goals and benefits now? Yes, of course. If you walk to work, you'll be late to work. <laughs> when it's not acceptable, it's the contrary. It is involuntary, it is uncontrolled, and there's no goal or no clear goal or benefits there. So we should not accept those. So I should end by giving the last take home, what I call it a layman, a layperson survival guide to social drinking. Because social drinking actually is very common. It is very unbecoming to tell the world that stops social drinking. So I would tell my friend or my colleagues or my audience here that if you must social drink, ladies and gentlemen, social drink responsibly in a controlled manner with clear goals in mind and say no. Definite no to binge drinking. But if that person has already developed AF or CV disease, diseases, total abstinence is the way. There's no way out. With that, I really thank you very much for your kind attention and also the kind invitation for me to speak on this wonderful topic. Thank you again. We'll see you soon. Bye. For your impressive presentation. My name is Reza Uri. I'm a medical student at Mercer University, and uh, I would like to ask you a question. My question is uh, Is there a difference between different types of drinking in terms of risk of develop uh, developing AP? Thank you. All right, great question. Uh, the question is on different types of drinking, i.e., is there a difference between drinking wine versus beer versus liquor? The answer is obviously there is a difference, at least in the short terms. According to the study done by Larson and colleagues, if you drink 14 to 21, moderate drinking in that sense, 14 to 21 Sunday drinks per week, those patients that are likely to develop AFib are those that drink liquor or wine. Why is that so? Well, the quickest explanation to that is the concentration of alcohol in those drinks. You saturate your blood level alcohol quicker. You actually flood your system so that your system not in time to detoxicate yourself. So am I saying that beer is better than wine or liquor? No, I'm not saying that. At the end of it, it's still about standard drinks per week which should be the gauge that we give to our patients or to our colleagues. If you drink more than 21 standard drinks per week, 
or although you, be, you drink beer all the time, that exceeds, you are falling in the category of heavy consumption. You are at risk of developing AFib anyway. So there is a difference, but not at the end. So if you must social drink, drink responsibly, don't exceed the allowance per week, which is seven cent drinks per week. You fall into the light consumption category. Help they answer the question, yeah. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, uh, hello, mister. Yeah. Is being drinking more harmful or same as heavy drinking over a period of time? Thank you for the question. Now, binge drinking, I uh, touched briefly on my uh, presentation earlier. Binge drinking is, is the worst type. Now, let's define what is binge drinking. Binge drinking is defined as having five or more standard drinks over a period of short time. Usually, we define as two hours. Five drinks over two hours, this is binge drinking or more. Now, binge drinking is definitely the worst type of social drinking, if you, if, you, if you think about it. It is even worse than drinking heavily over a period of time. Now, of course, if you drink heavily every day, then you might as well be defined as binge drinking all the time. So binge drinking is definitely a no-no if you want to social drink. I even jokingly tell my colleague that if you binge drink, it's not social drinking. <laughs> this is binge forceful drinking. So I won't categorize binge drinking as social drinking per se. So the answer is, yes, if it's more harmful, please do not do so. Thank you, sir. 